Hi, I'm Jason. This video is on the hot hand fallacy. A person subject to the hot hand fallacy believes a streak will persist despite each outcome being independent of the last. For example, suppose a spectator observes a basketball player taking a series of shots during a game. The spectator then makes predictions based on the observed shots, with good shots predicted to be more likely following a streak of successful shots. After a series of good shots, they believe that the player has a hot hand. Let's look at this example in more detail. Suppose a person takes 10 shots in a basketball game. In this image, a ball is a hit and X is a miss. To assess whether this person has a hot hand, we can look at their shots following a previous hit. For instance, in this sequence of shots, there are six occasions where we have a shot following a hit. Five successful shots, such as the seventh shot that is highlighted, are followed by another hit. We can then compare the player's average shooting percentage with the proportion of shots they hit if the shot immediately before was a hit. If their hit rate after a hit is higher than the normal shot probability, we might say they get a hot hand. Using this methodology, Gilovich and friends took shot data from various sources, including the Philadelphia 76ers and Boston Celtics, and examined the data for evidence of a hot hand. They also looked at whether there was a hit or miss after streaks of hits or misses. From this data, they argued that the hot hand was an illusion. There was no evidence that a player was more likely to make a shot following a sequence of successful shots. Gilovich and friends was the first of many examinations of whether there is a hot hand in sports. Through this research, there has been many methodological debates and arguments about whether there might be bias in the data, such as teams adjusting their defense in response to a player with a hot hand. However, the general trend in, literature, in the literature was a finding of no evidence of a hot hand. Miller and Sanherho provided a compelling critique of this position. They found a statistical bias in the analysis by Gilovich and friends and many others. The intuition behind the statistical bias is as follows. Suppose you flip a coin three times. There are eight possible sequences of heads and tails. Each sequence has an equal probability of occurring. Considering these sequences, if you were to flip a coin three times and there is a head followed by another flip in that sequence, what is the expected probability that another head will follow that first head? This table shows the proportion of heads following a previous flip of heads for each sequence. In the table's first row, heads, 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 the first flip is a head. Another head follows that first flip. After the second flip, a head, we also have a head. There is no flip after the third head. 100% of the heads in that sequence, followed by another flip, are followed by a head. In the second row of the table, heads, heads, tails, a head follows 50% of the heads. In the third row, there is one head followed by another flip, which is a tail. None of the heads in that sequence are followed by a head. And so on, until the last two rows where there are no heads followed by another flip. Now, back to our question. If you were to flip a coin three times and there is a head followed by another flip in that sequence, what is the expected probability that another head will follow that head? It turns out the answer to this question is 42%. I get this number by calculating the expected probability of a head given any particular sequence. This is equal to the average of the probabilities in each sequence. That calculation contrasts with what we get when we count across all of the sequences where we see eight flips of head followed by another flip. Of the subsequent flips, four are heads and four are tails, which is the 50% you expect. Why do we find that difference? By looking at these short sequences, we're introducing a bias. The cases of heads following heads tend to cluster together, such as in the first sequence, which has two cases of a head following a head. Yet the sequence tails, heads, tails, which has only one flip occurring after a head, is equally likely to occur as heads, heads, heads. A tail appears more likely to follow a heads because of this bias, whereby the streaks tend to cluster together. The expected probability I get when taking a series of three flips is 42%, when the actual probability of a head following a head is 50%. As the sequence of flips gets longer, the bias reduces in size, although it increases if we examine longer streaks, such as the probability of a head after three previous heads. 
The net effect of this bias is that the measure of the proportion of heads following another head is biased downwards. This bias is relevant to the analysis of the hot hand as it is present in the methodology of the papers that purportedly demonstrated that there was no hot hand in basketball, such as that by Gilovich and friends. They were effectively taking short streaks of shots and calculating what proportion of hits were followed by another hit. Their measure of the proportion of hits following a hit or sequence of hits is biased downwards. Like our calculation using coins, a calculation using that method results in a number lower than the actual probability of hitting a shot. Conversely, the hot hand pushes the probability of hitting a shot after a previous hit up. If there is a hot hand, we should see more hits following a previous hit. Now consider the net effect of these two forces. If there is a hot hand, the probability of hitting a shot after a previous hit should be higher than the average hit rate. The biased methodology pushes the measure in the other direction. Together, the downward bias and the hot hand counteract each other. In the case of Gilovich and friends, these two countervailing forces led to the conclusion by researchers that each shot is independent of the last. However, if you use a methodology not subject to this bias, you get a true measure of the hot hand. And in the case of Gilovich and friends data, removing the bias reveals a hot hand. Miller and Sanherho found that in the Gilovich and friends data, the probability of hitting a shot following a sequence of three previous hits is 13 percentage points higher than after a sequence of three misses. Here's another way of showing that there is a bias in this sequence. We'll do this using Bayes' rule with more than two variables. This rule operates in a similar man manner to our previous use of Bayes' rule. To understand this, suppose we have three possible outcomes, A, B, and C. For these outcomes, we can write the following probabilities. The joint probability of A and B and C is equal to the probability of A and B given C times the probability of C, which is also equal to the probability of A given B and C times the probability of B and C equals the probability of B given A and C times the probability of A and C, which equals the probability of C given A and B times the probability of A and B and so on. We can write the joint probabilities of these events as varying combinations of the conditional probabilities. Typically, we derive Bayes' rule by equating, equating any two of these equations. For example, as the probability of A given B and C times the probability of B, B and C equals the probability of B, B given A and C times the probability of A and C, we can rearrange this to write the probability of B, A given B and C equals the probability of B given A and C times the probability of A and C divided by the probability of B and C. We'll use this equation in our example. Now suppose we flip three coins and select at random one of the flips that follows our heads. This means if, that if we select a flip that follows a head, we'll select either flip two or flip three. If we select flip two, we know that flip one was a head. The first two flips in the sequence are either head tail, or head head. However, we can also say that if we selected flip two, head tail is twice as likely as head head. Why? Because if the first two coins were head head, we could also have chosen flip three. That is, if the first two flips are head tail, we can only select flip two. We select flip two, flip two with 100% probability. If the first two flips are head head, we select flip two with 50% probability and flip three with 50% probability. We are twice as likely to observe head tail as head head, given that we selected flip two. To show this, using head H, H subscript I or T subscript I to represent a head or a tail on the ith flip, and X subscript I to represent the selection of flip I, we can show the probability of a tail given we have selected flip two using Bayes' rule. Using the equation we derived earlier involving three potential outcomes, the probability of a tail on the second flip, given a head on the first flip and you have chosen flip two, equals the probability of choosing flip two, given there is a head on the first flip and a tail on the second flip, times the probability of a head on the first flip and a tail on the second flip, divided by the probability of a head on the first flip and picking the second flip. Expanding the denominator using the formula for total probability, it equals the probability of, a, of selecting the second flip given head on the first flip 
and tail on the second flip times the probability of head on the first flip and tail on the second flip divided by the probability of choosing the second flip given head on the first flip and tail on the second flip times the probability of head on the first flip and tail on the second flip plus probability of choosing the, the second flip given head on the first flip and head on the second flip times probability of head on the first flip given head on the second flip. And that equals one, that being the probability of selecting flip two given head on the first flip and tail on the second flip times 0.25, that being the probability of a head and a tail divided by one, which is the probability of picking flip two given a head on the first and a tail on the second times 0.25, that being the probability of a head on the first, tail on the second plus 0.5, that being the probability of picking flip two, given a head on the first and a head on the second, times 0.25, which equals the probability of a head on the first and a head on the second, which in turn equals two thirds. In contrast, the probability of a head on the second flip, given a head on the first and you've pick and flip two, picked flip two, equals the probability of picking flip two, given a head on the first and a head on the second, times the probability of a head on the first and a head on the second, divided by the probability of a head on the first and picking flip two, which in turn equals expanding the denominator using the formula for total probability, equals the probability of picking flip two given a head on the first and second flips times the probability of a head on the first and second flips, divided by the probability of picking flip two given a head on the first and a tail on the second times the probability of a head on the first and a tail on the second, plus the probability of picking flip two, given a head on both the first and second flip, times the probability of the head on the first and second flip, which in turn equals 0.5, that being the probability of picking the second flip, given a head on both the first and second flips, times 0.25, that being the probability of getting a head on the first and second flip. And that's divided by one, being the probability of picking flip two, given a head on the first and a tail on the second, times 0.25 that being the probability of a head on the first and the tail on the second, plus the probability of picking flip two given a head on both the first and second flip times 0.25, which is a probability of the head on the first and a head on the second. And that equals one third. As you can only select flip two if flip one is a head, we can also say that the probability of a tail on the second flip given a head on the first and picking flip two equals simply the probability of a tail in the second given flip picking given we have picked flip two which equals two thirds and the probability of a head on the second given a head in the first and picking flip two equals the probability of a head on the second and picking given we've picked flip two which equals one third that is the probability of a tail given we have selected flip two is two thirds the probability of a head given we have selected flip two is one third we are twice as likely to observe a, a tail on the second flip as a head on the second flip given we have selected flip two. We don't see the same bias if we select flip three. If we select flip three, we know that flip two was a head. But the fact we select flip three does not tell us anything about what flip three is, as flip three does not influence the choice of flip. Whether flip three is a head or tail is independent of the choice of flip three or the outcome of flip two. Accordingly, the probability of a tail on flip three, given there's a head on the second flip, and you've picked the third flip simply equals the probability of a tail on flip three, which equals one half. Similarly, the probability of a head on flip three, given there's a head on flip two and we've picked flip three, simply equals the probability of a head on flip three, which also equals one half. We now combine the results of our examination of the second and third flip. We are equally likely to select flip, through, select flip two or flip three as flips one and two will be each be heads with 50% probability. If both are heads, we select one randomly. Given we selected a flip, what is the probability that the following flip is a head? So the probability of a head equals the probability that we select flip two times the probability that flip two is a head given we selected flip two, plus the probability uh, that we choose flip three times the probability that flip three is a head given we selected flip three. And that in turn equals 0.5 times 0.33 plus 0.5 times 0.5, which equals 0.417. What does this mean for measurement of the hot hand? As for before, if I take a sequence of three flips and I look at a flip after a head, if there is at least one head, 
the probability that flip is ahead is 0.42. This is despite the coin flips being independent. It appears that I have a cold hand. Use that same methodology in a scenario where there is a hot hand, the bias will counteract the hot hand and make it harder to detect if it can be detected at all. Despite the evidence that there is a hot hand in some sports, there is strong evidence that there still exists a hot hand fallacy. People see streaks in truly random processes with each outcome independent of the last. For example, Aiton and Fisher found that when people predict the results of a roulette wheel's spins, they increase their confidence in their predictions after a series of successes. Their confidence increases despite the outcome being random. Interestingly, they also exhibit the gambler's fallacy in what they predict. 